Hello, good afternoon, everybody. It's good to see you. My name is Kathleen Strauss, and I am um, proud today to be bring you a talk on cervicogenic dizziness. Today, we have a guest speaker who is a very experienced physical therapist in neurological and vestibular therapy, uh, Dr. Nicole Acera. She's going to be joining us shortly. I'm going to add her to the talk as I introduce myself and then introduce the topic and give people time to gather. So let me bring in Nicole. Hi, Nicole. Can you hear me? I can. Good morning. Good morning. So we are live and um, we're going to give people a little bit of time to gather and give me a thumbs up or a comment if you can. Let me see. I should be able to see live viewer comments. Um, yep. Let's see. Okay, I got a thumbs up. So we're good to go. Well, my name is Kathleen Strauss. As I said, I'm 30 years working with vestibular patients um, in physical therapy. The rehabilitation of vestibular patients is something I've been passionate about. And in this 30 years, we've learned a lot about different kinds of things um, that cause vestibular problems. Dizziness related to neck disorders is one of those elusive topics and is difficult to understand and even more difficult sometimes to find a practitioner that can help us and guide us into understanding it and then finding a solution. I know in my practice, um, the, the neck and the involvement of the neck um, was always almost always the case because even patients with dizziness and vertigo will have neck pain and um, So we talk about the neck a lot Sometimes the neck can be the cause of it of the vertigo and sometimes it can be something that is a secondary Sign so our symptom. So I'm really excited to have Dr. Acera today She's going to introduce herself and then we're going to have her do a presentation where she's going to talk about what we know about cervicogenic dizziness, which used to be called cervical vertigo from where I was um, and uh, now, but more people are using the word cervicogenic dizziness. She's going to talk to us about that, tell us about her experience, and then we're going to take your questions. So I love that I see people on the chat. This is a new interface for us, so we're working on being able to see your live comments, which is wonderful. We're glad you're, you're all here from Northern California and um, everywhere else that you are. Shout out to where you are so we can give credit to you. So Nicole, Dr. Nicole Acera, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm a physical therapist working here in Canada. I have 21 years of um, uh, physiotherapy treatment. Being that I'm Canadian, I will often flip back and forth and say physiotherapy instead of physical therapy. They mean the same thing up here. Um, so I, I got my degrees in Canada and uh, my undergraduate degrees in psychology and physiotherapy. And then I went to Australia and I where I did my PhD. And I've been practicing in Vancouver now since 2006. Um, I work both publicly and in the private system, and uh, I absolutely love working with people with cervicogenic dizziness and dizziness in general. It's a, a, an interesting area of practice for sure. It's, got, it's a very controversial area of practice, um, but it's one that uh, um, people really need an advocate for and support for. So I think it's a, it's a very, actually, I love the diagnostic challenge of it, the putting it all together, the finding figuring out what's going on. I think it's just a wonderful area of practice to work in. So yeah, great to be here today. Looking forward to the questions that come our way. That's right. Well, tell us a little bit about cervicogenic dizziness. What is it? That's kind of a mouthful. Um, what does it mean? And, and how did it get that name? Yeah, the, you know, I think there's been in the, lit in the medical literature, you can see um, dizziness related to neck trauma or neck injuries going back to the 1800s. So this is not brand new. Um, probably the, um, most people coined the 1955 research paper that called it cervical vertigo. Um, and over time, the, you know, there, there isn't a firm consensus at this point on the diagnostic criteria and exactly what it's made up of. So you will see variability from one clinician to another. But yeah. um, most people would say that dizziness related to dizziness and imbalance related to neck and neck pain and neck injury or, or neck degeneration in the neck or, or, or some of something else going on in the neck at the same time. A lot of people will shift towards cervicogenic dizziness as a label. And the reason that most people are dropping the cervical vertigo part is that vertigo as a word means like spinning. Or that 
spinning or whirling or tilting. Um, and we don't see a lot of that with neck related dizziness. The predominant symptoms are more of a vague sense of dizziness or disorientation. And so I think that's why most clinicians have moved, shifted to cervicogenic dizziness. Good, good, good. Well, keep going. I know you have a, an outline and I want to make sure you just kind of go along. So if, 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 is vertigo required for us to have cervicogenic dizziness or are you saying some people don't have vertigo? No, no. The signs and symptoms vary person to person. Actually, there have been a couple of research studies that have kind of looked at surveys of what kinds of symptoms people come with. So like, what are we seeing coming in the clinic? Well, we can see quite a variety of symptoms when people first come in. Uh, most people are going to have sort of the more classic ones like um, um, they're going to have, you know, uh, some imbalance and postural imbalance. It might stumble here and there, lose their, their bearings at times. They're going to feel senses of dizziness. Um, they might have headache as well. Mm -hmm. Some people will have ringing in the ears. It's more commonly on the higher pitch end of the spectrum, but some people will have some changes there or some jaw uh, symptoms as well, some tightness around there. Um, and th those are the kind of symptoms that you see more commonly. And oftentimes what you're going to hear is someone's going to say, as my neck pain is worse, my dizziness is worse. And when I get mm -hmm. neck treatment that gives me relief, I see a relief or a, a reduction in this sort of vague senses of dizziness or disorientation they feel. If that could make so, sense. That's what you tend to see as a typical. So how do people get diagnosed? I mean, do people know where to go? So let's say you have some dizziness, maybe some um, symptoms on your neck. Where do people go, and where do, where do you suggest they go to find help and diagnosis? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So the, the problem with cervicogenic dizziness is that most clinicians feel that it should be a diagnosis of exclusion. So that's a complicated uh, process to go through. Um, excluding, but the goal is actually before you actually get to the point where you say someone has neck related dizziness, you really should be looking at um, what are the other more common causes of dizziness that you need to rule out? You know, the most common thing would be that the crystal problem in the inner ear, the benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. And we know that can happen after things like trauma. So if someone has been in a car accident and has dizziness, you can't just jump to the conclusion that they have neck related dizziness. You kind of have to put in some time and effort with the person and rule out the, the crystal um, issue that can come up benign proxismal positional vertigo, ruling out other causes, maybe for example, concussion type, you can get dizziness related to concussion, you can get dizziness related to uh, other conditions. Of course, there's also a lot of medical conditions completely outside of the inner ear that can cause feelings of faintness or dizziness, the issues with the heart, um, obviously stroke, some of the, you know, bigger things. Um, even medication interactions are a big are a big issue. Blood pressure issues. There's a lot of different reasons that are not even related to the inner ear. So the challenge with, with cervicogenic dizziness is that you really need to find a clinician who has a broad range of skills. They have to be highly skilled. They, they even cite that in a number of research papers, how important that is. There is no gold standard test. There's no clinical test or laboratory test or blood test nothing at all like that that can guarantee that you do have this diagnosis you can't just have an mri and figure it out there's no single test and i said as i said before there's no single set of symptoms so you can't just walk into the clinic and boom it's done it's all over with you really need to work with a clinician um, to explain the onset of your symptoms how did it happen what's the evolution over time you know, see what's been going on, and then currently how you're presenting, and then they need to take their time to slowly go through the process and say, okay, well, it's not this, it's not that, it's not this, and 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 that's, so I think at the end of the day, that's the real problem, is you need someone who's got uh, a highly skilled, who's been doing this for some period of time, they have, they have to have postgraduate training in um, the, the treatment and management of dizziness issues. So what would be a typical route through the medical system that you think is common? I know that people get to you different ways, but yeah. um, what would be a common route? Maybe it differs from one country to the next, but what about for you? And I can tell. Yeah, no, I've worked in Canada, the UK, Australia, and um, the US. So I can say that it, it does vary country to country and even state by state, province by province, or so there's some variability. Um, I, there was a paper that was, uh, that's been often cited where I think the average person with dizziness sought 4.5 healthcare providers before they had a confirmed diagnosis. 
um, that's that's a that's a lot of effort to be put in yeah. um, by somebody. So someone has to have complained to a number of different people and shared their story and uh, and and had to persist for some period of time. That can be really challenging, and I do find that with neck related dizziness. Um, that that can be an issue. So again, we don't have a, a gold standard diagnostic criteria. So you'll need to do a little bit of homework. The VITA website uh, can maybe help you. Navigating the medical system is truly a challenge. Um, you need to um, you know, look for people in your area, speak to your family doctor, um, speak to colleagues. Um, and even if you are already seeing a healthcare provider, like let's say for example, you have neck symptoms, but also this dizziness piece, your physio might be doing a really good job of dealing with the neck symptoms and they're getting better and the dizziness is moving in the right direction, but it's still not solved. You might need to ask them if they know a specialist, maybe there's one at their clinic or in your home community that could help you with that. That's sort of the possibility. What do we think cervicogenic dizziness is? What what causes dizziness with neck pain? I mean, we talk a lot at the Vestibular Disorders Association about the inner ear and the vestibular system and the brain and the parts of the brain. But what do we know medically about cervicogenic dizziness? And what does a diagnosis of exclusion mean? Maybe that's part of this question. Yeah, that's a great question. And it's got kind of many answers. So. What I would maybe start with is saying that, you know, I mentioned in the beginning that you can feel dizziness for a wide range of reasons, not even related to the inner ear. But let's just focus in our conversation on, um, you know, uh, like, for example, balance. Balance doesn't exist like a thing. It's not like a chair. You walk in another room, it's still there. It doesn't move. Balance is actually a, a mental calculation that your brain makes. So you take in information from your eyes, from your inner ears and from your joint receptors. And we have some kind of hotspots from our joint receptors that give us more information than others. And our neck is one of those areas that gives us a good amount of information about where we are in space. And so um, what the clinicians need to do is kind of sort out where your symptoms are coming from. Now you ask the question, well, where does cervical joint dizziness come from? We're not really sure. Um, it's probably not one cause. It's probably more than one way to get to that place. So um, uh, an obvious one might be after like, let's say whip, whiplash trauma. So, you know, if you look at a population of whiplash patients, research studies vary from as little as 20 to 78%, it's 58 and 78%. So it's quite a wide range of, of those patients will complain of some, some feelings of dizziness or disorientation. Um, but if you look in the general population, we don't know the incidence of cervicogenic dizziness. If you look at research, though, for example, in a uh, neck surgery population, a portion of people with who've had neck surgery months and years afterwards will have changes in their balance and a portion of those people will have dizziness. So it could be that um, it could be related to trauma. It could be related to surgery. It could be just a slow evolution over time. And we don't know where it's coming from. But what's probably happening is that our brain calculates where we are in space based on information from our eyes, our inner ears, and our neck. And it has to massage that information and make a complete story about where you are in space. And so most of the time that works really well. And some of the time we like to play with that. For example, um, if you go to an IMAX movie, you like to sometimes feel immersed in the, in the story. So they make cushy seats, a very large screen, and you kind of feel like you are doing what the actors are doing. And so that's going to be a fun way of playing with your vestibular system. You can get tricked into thinking that you're part of the scene. And that can work. That can work for you. Um, you can also have moments where you get tricked to like, let's say you're on a train and there's a train beside you and one of them goes to move. And for a brief moment, you're not sure who moved because your brain is gathering information from your eyes, your inner ear and your neck all the time and all your other joint receptors to figure out and make the story about where you are and what's moving. Are you moving or is the world moving? And so if there's a disruption in the neck receptors and as they speak to the brain, either mm. through pain or changes in the joint or after surgery or trauma, we think that for a portion of people who have that disruption or change, it gives them this byproduct where they feel dizziness, where they feel uncertainty about where they are and it affects their balance and it feels and those feelings of dizziness. So it's not a very good answer. There, there are other pr proposed causes of dizziness um, related to the vertebral arteries going up and, and there's a few other different competing um, 
philosophies or, or, or approaches that we think it could be coming from. But I, at the end of the day, the, one of the biggest problems we have is there's no single uh, ideology or source that we can identify. It's not like the crystal problem where the crystals belong right. in one place, they're somewhere else, and then it's kind of mechanical plumbing problem. This is a bit more complicated. There's all the, the competing wiring and the competing calculations in your brain. Well, it's I, I love what you said. It's 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 complicated. And it sounds like then that everyone doesn't present the same. What do you say to the person who feels like they have abnormal eye movements from the neck? Do you think that that sound reasoning to say that I have nystagmus and I have neck related dizziness? Um, because, you know, when we talk about crystals moving in the ear, we're pretty familiar with the idea that when the vestibular system isn't working right because of these particles out of place, it causes this reflexive eye movement we call nystagmus. What about cervicogenic generated nystagmus? Do you see that? Yeah, so there is some nystagmus that can occasionally be generated from the neck, but it's not common. It wouldn't be the most common finding. Um, you're talking at the moment about the crystal problem, BPPV. And yes, position change relative to gravity can cause the nystagmus. If you were to, if you were to see nystagmus, which isn't a common finding in neck-related dizziness, it would be related to the, the neck moving. So like turning your body like this, for example, would be would be where you'd find it. You wouldn't get it with you moving relative to gravity per se. So nystagmus is not a common feature. That might be why the vertigo is not a common symptom that we hear about. Um, but we will occasionally see that. Um, you can see videos online the odd time, and um, there are some publications written about it. But it's not a predominant feature. Do some people maybe have more than one diagnosis? Like, would you think yes. that maybe someone could have neck-related dizziness and an eye movement issue? Absolutely. As I mentioned before, if you were in a car accident, there's no reason why you couldn't suffer from both the crystal problem and a concussion or neck related dizziness um, and neck trauma or the uh, competing multiple diagnoses is actually really common. I find that interesting. You know, from a research perspective, we have to um, limit the people who are included in a study to the exact yes. problem. But in reality, you're probably not including all the real people who experience more than one issue. So I think that's one you know little downside. Well, I think you touched on a lot. So um, as the clinician, if a person can have more than one thing and there's not really a way to you know diagnose it exactly, how would um, you go about formulating a treatment plan. You know, you you just showed where you turned your whole body or versus where you turned your head. I mean, it sounds like this is why you need a really highly skilled clinician, one who can come up with some tests that maybe aren't the traditional vestibular tests. Speak to that. Yeah, so if I have someone come into the clinic, they would uh, give me a history of what's gone on. As I mentioned, how the system started, how they've evolved over time. So you spend quite a bit of time actually understanding the story and, and, and really what someone means. So if someone says they're dizzy, dizzy, I don't just write that down and take it at face value. I make sure I really understand what they mean and under what scenarios and situations. Um, then I would look for the, you know, you can do the regular, um, vestibular ocular testing that we would do. We would screen for the crystal problem, BPPV. There are standard um, uh, uh, um, assessments for that to make sure that's not the issue. And then there are some special tests that we can actually pull out. So there is the head neck differentiation test, um, the cervical torsion test, um, the joint positioning error. So how, what percentage of error do you make when you um, to when you turn your when you turn your neck, do you know where your neck is in space, or have you lost some of that uh, awareness? And then there's the smooth pursuit neck torsion test. Um, you know, there's quite a few different individual tests that we can do. There are a few publications that have actually kind of nicely outlined them. Actually, I'll make sure you have a link for one uh, for Riley in 2017. Um, they gave a nice review that kind of talks through. Uh, breaks it down how you kind of systematically go through that diagnostic process. And at the end of the day, if the person's dizziness um, and imbalance seem to go up and down with neck pain, and if they test positively with a number of these tests, then we, th we move forward to the next phase. And that would be to see how you respond to treatment. So let's say neck pain, your dizziness is worse with neck pain, then let's relieve your neck pain by doing hands-on techniques and home exercises to release your neck pain. And let's see how far that goes. And actually, incidentally, that actually 
It's part treatment, of course, but it's also part assessment. It's confirming our assessment, if that makes sense. And I probably yeah. should mention that a lot of people who have dizziness for other reasons will tighten their neck. So a lot of people, when they feel dizzy, they will freeze up a little bit. They'll, they'll create some tension around here to move less or move less frequently or less often or less far. Um, so, so that's another thing to keep in mind. So if I see someone who has, you know, reduced neck range of motion um, and, and some muscle tension in general, I don't jump to assume that it's cervicogenic dizziness. I still take the time, mm -hmm. do the special test that we have available that can help us move in that direction. And I want to see what happens when we treat the neck. That's good. Um, so it sounds like, like my practice and many other vestibular therapists, we rule out all the things that it could be first. You mentioned ruling out BPPV, for example. And so we don't start with thinking cervicogenic dizziness first. We rule out all the other things first and then see if the dizziness responds um, to neck treatments. Um, so that's why it requires a really customized plan. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And so I guess the customized plan is actually really, really important. I'm glad you brought that up because, um, you know, everyone's going to have a different, slightly different set of symptoms. And then here's another important thing. Everyone has different goals. You're going to have very different expectations of what life is going to look like if you are um, a mother with three children than if you are 80 years old and you really just need to be able to try to see if you can preserve your ability to drive. So it's going to look very different. Your expectations how quickly you move, what, what movements you need to make to, to have a successful day. Um, so I think that's really important is to set, set goals and not even just set goals, also measure your progress with your clinician. I would say that's also another thing to keep in mind. So there is no clinical practice guideline that says every clinician should be treated with this protocol. There are no protocols. There's no one tried and true way that is the best way of moving forward. That's the downside. We have some challenges with the evidence. The best evidence is telling us that manual therapy is the, is the, is the, um, is the first place to go. And then seeing whether we need to add on vestibular rehab exercises and strategies. And I guess there's a lot more to it than just that. But, but as a starting point would be um, set your goals, get a customized treatment plan, and move forward from there. What would be an example of um, a problem you might see in a cervicogenic patient and then what would be an exercise that you might give them? And I know, and, I, and it goes without saying that we are not um, diagnosing, treating, or um, you know, curing any disease in this talk. Of course, we want you all to consult your health care practitioner, but I'd love to hear maybe if you give me an example of what someone might see in cervical uh, in treatment for cervical vertigo, cervicogenic dizziness, that they might not see in traditional therapy. You said manual yeah. therapy often works, but are there are there other things? Yeah, good question. So I'll start with the manual therapy because that's where the evidence is best. The evidence is telling us that no single treatment technique is the bomb or the best answer. There's no one single technique that's going to fix everyone's problem. So um, you'll need to find a clinician that has maybe a range of skills. So one therapist might do, and, and you know, the, the reality is a lot of clinicians are probably like me that they're a little eclectic. So I would do um, more manual therapy, you know, mo joint mobilizations with one person, and the next person I might feel that's not really gonna work for them, that they're quite reactive, they're quite tight, they're feeling quite tense and uncertain about things. And maybe I would start off with something more gentle, like maybe myofascial release or muscle energy release techniques to sort of get in there before I even jump on the joints and feel what's going on and kind of get in there and poke into one place. So I think that the reality is that there's, there's a, there is no gold standard treatment that is the best um, a technique. They've they've put certain techniques head to head to figure out if one's better than the other. And that hasn't come up as, as nothing has come up as the winner per se. Um, and then on top of that, you know, I my philosophy is I like to treat the person, not just the problem. So if someone if I'd like to get in and feel what a couple of the joints feel like, because I have an instinct, there's something going on because I can see when they turn their neck, they're too tight. Maybe that first session, I can't just jump in there. Maybe I have to do some muscle relaxing techniques um, and, and get them sort of in a better place so that I can go in there and, and get to the sensitive area. Um, I know here 
uh, one thing a lot of uh, physios in Canada at least do, and I'm sure it's the same where you are, is that when we do get in there and release the range and get people so they can turn further, we also like to give them home exercises to maintain that range. So just because you can do something in a one-off in a clinic doesn't mean you can necessarily sustain it over time. So we like to pair hands-on treatment with home exercises, be that stretching, um, be that active movements that the people practice. Um, th those are the kinds of things we would do. So a lot of people, a lot of clinicians will start with manual therapy first, get someone's neck in a little bit of a better place and reduce some of the overall neck pain and dizziness. And then they'll start layering in vestibular rehab exercises. And vestibular rehab exercises includes the full suite of exercises that you would have heard about on the other Facebook live chats. Um, and you'll see on the Vita website when they talk about what does vestibular rehab include. It could be habituation exercises to desensitize your system to certain movements. It could mean adaptation, working on your gaze stabilization type exercises. And it could be substitution where you're doing different eye exercises to kind of um, get those reflexes, you know, optimize them in some way. So it's going to look different for different people. So if yeah. you had a neighbor who was seen by the same clinician, your treatment program could and probably should look very different. But if you've got those goals and you're measuring your progress, then you should be able to both see progress, even though it's not going to look the same. You alluded to it earlier. It sounds like the um, the variations in the way it presents and even the variations in the cause of the problem, there, that might impede research in this area um, and make it difficult. I know I've scanned the research too, and as we try to present um, research-based, evidence-based data, and we look for clinical pathways and clinical guidelines, this is a tough one because it, it, it's, you can't say for sure that their neck is too loose or that it's too tight. You can't yeah. say that it's the muscles or the myofascial system or the joints. You don't it, you don't really know. So finding a homogeneous group or a group of like patients can be difficult. Do you think that'll impact our progress in this area? And, oh, and absolutely. Because the thing with research is, um, you know, we we're trying to answer important questions with research. That's, you know, at the end of the day, we have an important question. We try to come up with a, a testable, feasible plan that we can test. We, but there are constraints. There's financial constraints, there's finding the patients, there's um, the time and effort it takes for them to come to the clinic. So what clinicians do, uh, people like me who have their PhD will help create research uh, plans. And so we'll say, okay, well, right. So we're, you know, we're gonna have a, well, I think you'll notice though in the, in the research, if you do start going down to PubMed and, and going down the rabbit hole of reading the research, you'll notice a lot of the studies are quite small. Mm -hmm. And it's either hard to get people or the finances aren't there to, to make a large study. Um, and they also will often lack a control group or a group that receives a sham treatment, kind of like the mm -hmm. idea with medications where you get the active drug and the sugar pill. That same idea, there's there's less, you know, there's a lot of studies that are missing that piece of it as well. Yes. So um, it's, it's very time consuming to do these research studies and there isn't the financial backing. I just mentioned the pharmaceutical yes. industry, they would have, you know, large, you know, large pools of money to draw from and, and physio doesn't have that as a you know there's no uh there's no sponsor for doing an exercise so there is no there's no nike sponsorship there's no <laughs> there's no endorsements that way so we well, don't so we're talking challenge. yeah i love what you said about research and the constraints we have and so so um it almost means then that the treatments themselves are alternative just by nature, that they're not supported by research. Mm -hmm. Are there things that, I mean, if you're lucky enough to find a clinician who has experience in the manual therapy and the vestibular therapy, that'd be great. Are there things though that the medical professionals do for these patients before they find a therapist? Like are there medications or surgeries or within the traditional medical model, do they try things first before they send well, you to a physio? Yeah. So I mean, do a lot of people actually, are you thinking more like, do a lot of people go seek alternative clinicians before they come to physical therapy or? No, I was thinking like if you went to the doctor first, so you started your primary care physician or um, because you've had a car accident or you go to an orthopod and orthopedic doctor and you have x-rays and, you know, are they likely to give you drugs first? Because I think um, at least in my practice, people might start with painkillers or muscle relaxers or, you know, kind of things to reduce the pain and reduce the muscle spasm. So that sometimes that's the first line of yep. approach. And for some, they might 
fail at that. And then they start saying, this isn't going away. It's been however many weeks. They gave me a week's worth of pain medicine and they gave me muscle relaxers and I'm still not better. So then the, the client continues to look. And so at that point, if the client starts looking, then it, it seems alternative. They may or may not find a doctor who knows what to do with them. And, and that's been my experience, which then, you know, begs the question, if you can't find a therapist and you're, you're on your journey, are there anything outside the scope of traditional practice that you think people use or that might be helpful? Any complementary alternative approaches like acupuncture or massage or anything? Yep. Yeah, good question. So I'll unpack little pieces of it. So I would say that a lot of people will start with going to your family doctor and starting from there. They might get sent, as you say, for x-rays and whatnot, and, and they'll start with painkillers, muscle relaxants. It's a really common place to start. But then again, um, for some people, that might be enough because once you've gotten rid of some of that neck pain, it might reduce things enough that things settle, they calm, and then you're, you, you get well and, and you're, you're on Bob's your uncle, you're done. Um, for those, though, that the dizziness persists, um, I think it is really important, again, to be sent to see um, a clinician who specializes in vestibular rehabilitation um, and who has a bit of a blended skill set where they have their, they're able to assess the neck and the other issues that are related to dizziness. Um, in terms of alternatives, you know, I, I did search again to see if anything new had come up and I looked under, you know, topics like yoga and um, and a few other of those kind of labels. And at the moment, there is no research study that's been published that says, you know, the benefits of yoga for cervicogenic dizziness. And yet I can say as a clinician, the deep breathing and the stretching and the relaxing and calming yourself down and then also adding on the layer of the physical therapy exercises, yoga could be part of someone's treatment program and yet there's no research for it at all. And I think this is one of the challenges. Um, going back to the research issue, actually, I would say that having done a PhD, I can tell you that when you set a protocol, you can't change it. You have to take the time to go through the entire process for the six months or a year to finish your research project. And then you have to you know, write it up, submit it for publication. There's a long delay in this process. It's not a quick turnaround. And you have to stick to that protocol. But as a clinician, I'm much more fluid. I, I work with the person and where they're at. We set a set of goals. We assess what's working. And then we kind of... Um, as they achieve their goals, they set new goals and new goals and new goals. And you, none of that is captured in research. So return to exercise, return to work, um, return to learn, all these different things, there's no, there's no research for it. There's no clinical practice guidelines for it. They're, they're developing in other areas like the concussion community, for example. So if you have neck related dizziness related concussion, they're starting to move in that direction with that group, but not with cervicogenic dizziness. Uh, and when you look at the different alternative approaches, um, you know, there isn't a research article that says that one is better than another, like, um, you know, acupuncture or uh, or whatever. There, there's some gentle recommendations. There are some things that are bubbling up, but we're not at that point where we can give a firm, yes, this works or no, that doesn't work. The approach would be to manage your neck pain in a way that you feel is appropriate. So if you have seen a chiropractor and or a certain massage therapist and been very happy with their services in the past, you could try that again as your first starting point. But if that doesn't seem to be working for you, you might need to move on and, and, and deal with also the, um, the dizziness per se, which might mean someone who specializes in vestibular disorders. Well, how is there a way to know how long someone should try something before they start to feel better? Or in your practice, let's just say you do find the gold star clinician who has experience with manual therapy and cervical cervicogenic dizziness and manual skills and um, vestibular skills. How long before someone starts to feel better in your practice and in general? Well, this is actually an important piece of it. I actually really want to see what someone's uh, over time, what, what's happening. So what I expect to see over time is that people can do, can handle, let's say I give someone, um, let's say I do some hands-on therapy in the moment. I want them to feel better after that session. I want their dizziness to improve and I want their, um, I want their, um, their neck pain to re reduce. Maybe they might have a headache that improves, for example. In the session, I would want to see change. But what I'm kind of suspicious of is someone will come say to me, well, I've been seeing my ex-therapist every week for the past six months, and I feel great that day, but I don't feel better within a couple of hours or within a day or two. To me, that's not sustained benefit. Something still is missing in that puzzle. So yes, 
immediate reduction of pain might in your neck might actually help you, but it's not giving you that long-term benefit. So I want to see a change over time. So within, let's say I see someone now and then three weeks from now, I'll do hands-on treatment and then I'll give them a series of home exercises to progress in a specific way over the next two or three weeks. And then I would see them again. I would expect to see some change. I would expect to see that they're better able to tolerate the exercise, that their recovery rate is getting faster, um, that, they're, that it, it, the symptoms are less intense day to day, and that they're starting to develop their own toolkit, their own personal toolkit of self-management strategies. And then that you progress that over time. So often you see in the research studies, for example, with the neck therapy, oftentimes they're in, around about the, the 12 week mark is a pretty typical one that people will often, mm -hmm. so oftentimes people will be getting, you know, two, six months physio, depending on what goals they have, their starting point. If they keep adding new goals or if they just stick to the original goals, um, you know, it might change over time. But you'd want to see someone um, for a defined period of time and you'd want to make sure that you're, you're seeing progression week over week in small ways. How would you... Um I don't want to put you on the spot here because we've got such a heterogeneous group of patients and, and everybody's different, but what would you tell someone the prognosis might be for cervicogenic dizziness? We understand positive prognosis for BPPV with particle repositioning, and that's really exciting, but is it different for the person who might have this neck-related dizziness? Yeah, it's a very difficult one to give someone a sense of prognosis. I have some people who I see who have complete resolution of all symptoms and feel fabulous and they have no follow up exercises to do. I see other people who would say they're probably 75% better and they kind of once a week or, or, or so they kind of have a bit of a maintenance dose of certain stretches or exercises that they do long term to kind of keep things um, at bay. I mean, I, I'd say even within myself, I'm the same. I, I fell and broke my arm once and I still do a couple of stretches at the gym a couple of times a week just to keep things in good order. I broke my foot once and I can barely remember which foot it is. I have no ongoing symptoms. So it, it isn't just vestibular disorders that can be this variable in, in the prognosis. What I would say is that everyone should be able to have a meaningful change in their symptoms. They should be able to have uh, self-management strategies that they can do, whether that's exercises or stretches or changes in posture or changes in the way they ha they have their lifestyle or, or, or the way they set things up, even just like the way the computer is set up or different things. They should have different things that keep them so they have less symptoms day to day and that they can manage their symptoms even without seeing the clinician. They should say meaningful changes in that. So I'd like to um, look at the questions that people have uh, participated in the chat. It's wonderful to see everybody here. And um, we're in a closed Facebook group right now, I think, but so I'm not going to share names, uh, but I will and put the comments on. I thought I was going to put the comments on the thing, but I'm not going to because of just um, confidentiality. But people are asking about, you mentioned the vasculature in the neck. Um, in my practice years ago, I included vertebral basilar artery and vascular issues among the cervical vertigo things. But it looks like now the word cervicogenic dizziness sort of separates out the vascular problems and we call those different. Um, can a vascular problem be part of cervicogenic dizziness? That would be one of the controversies. I think if you were to ask a range of clinicians, they give you different answers. And some would say, oh, yes, absolutely. And other people would say, oh, no, 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 no. You should be very specific and you should separate them out. So I think what I would say is probably as a clinician, what matters to me is finding the root cause as much as I can. So if I know it's related to um, the blood flow, then there are different exercises and strategies and advice than for someone where it's just related to some tight muscles, let's say the muscles that connect, for example, let's say they're getting it the, right up here, the muscles are connecting and some of their posture issues. Maybe that's more where their symptoms are coming from. So um, what's important is for me is not just a diagnostic label, but what do you do with that information? So what advice do you give someone? How do you help someone navigate uh, feeling more comfortable day to day? That's good. Someone in the chat mentions that once they were prescribed um, prism glasses even for it. So it looks like there's a lot of patients or people watching who have experienced multiple things going on at once. Um, 
including some eye issues and having to use prism glasses. And um, this one says, I passed all my vestibular tests with fine colors. So are there any vestibular diagnostic tests that we know about, like the caloric test or the posturography or the other ones that are traditional that, that prove positive for cervicogenic dizziness? Or is it typical that they all pass them with flying colors, like this person says? I will get some people who pass all of those laboratory tests with flying colors. I will I will probably more commonly see people who will pass their caloric. The caloric test is really looking at that vestibular nerve um, and the vestibular nerve is not impacted with neck related dizziness because there are different places. One's the nerve, the little short cranial nerve eight that goes from your inner ear to your brain. And then the neck is obviously much further down. So I will get, uh, I probably will more commonly see people who have some light changes in balance. They're not maybe failing for their age group, but there's some light changes there. They just don't, don't, don't quite have the balance they should have for their age. Um, interestingly enough, again, back to the research, I'm not often seeing research studies that include balance testing as one of the outcome measures of a successful treatment program when you talk about prognosis, interestingly enough. So there is no single lab test, there's no single blood test, there's no single um, clinical test that confirms cervicogenic dizziness. So if someone is passing tests related to the, the vestibular nerve and BPPV, that's great. That's part of the diagnosis of exclusion piece of it. That's wonderful news. The next step is to start doing some of those special tests around the neck and looking to see if the day to day you're noticing changes in neck range of motion and neck pain and whatnot are more related to your dizziness or neck sustained neck postures where you hold a position for a long period of time. Are you having a lot of dizziness when you look at it in one position for a long time, for example? So in and of itself, having those tests be negative or is not a concern for someone who's treating cervical joint dizziness. In fact, a lot of those are normally positive, negative. Sorry, there's, there, there's nothing there. Yeah. A lot of patients who have vestibular problems, whether it be vestibular migraine or PPPD or superior canal dehiscence, whatever it, the cause of their vestibular problem, they're also complaining of neck problems. And in the chat, I see people saying, you know, what do I do for my neck issues um, that maybe come from something else? Is, is this the same kind of healthcare practitioner I would see? And then tell me, how do I find one? And who is it? Is it an ENT, a neurotologist, a, a therapist? What kind? So, yeah. And a lot of people, um, you know, so I guess, yeah, I, I would say even if I look at my own practice, when I first graduated and I was really interested in treating the neck and was really b building those skills in a really effective way, I would say if someone came to me with dizziness, I would first want to treat their neck because I was more comfortable with it. And as I developed both skill sets over time, I now feel like I have a, a bit more way, I can navigate that a little bit easier. So I would say that, that the downside is that, uh, you do have to speak frankly with your clinician a little bit. So you need to say, I've seen you, let's say for some uh, someone who has who treats um, BPPV really well in a community, that's great. That's a big part of their practice. But they may say, I don't really treat cervical joint dizziness. I really keep my focus to the benign paroxysmal positional vertigo population. So you do need to kind of speak to them a bit. In terms of which healthcare provider, it does vary a little bit country to country and place by place. Um, ear, nose, and throat doctors have also a wide range in their practice. Some of them mm -hmm. do more work around, uh, they might work with more children, they might work more with noses, they might work with, you know, there's a lot of different things they can do. Not all ENTs um, have a large practice that's neck dizziness related, or even dizziness related for that matter. Um, the neurotologists though are more specialized. They have that dual, you know, um, neurology and otology kind of background. Right. So uh, they'll be much more um, familiar with treating cervicogenic dizziness. But I think um, asking them, asking the clinicians directly, uh, is this a good fit? I think I have an instinct that my, my symptoms are related to my neck. Um, I'd like to have both looked at both my neck and the dizziness issue and to see where you go from there might be helpful. That's a great answer. And I know in the chat, um, we have provided links for you to find vestibular rehab practitioners. Um, and it, I, my, my perspective on this is that even among vestibular practitioners who have studied the work and are proficient in treating vestibular disorders, there's a variety of experiences with specific neck 
related dizziness. So I guess what I'm saying is that sometimes, I mean, I, in my practice, see patients who've been to other vestibular therapists who haven't quite had the management they need for their neck related dizziness. So you might have to look around and that it's okay to find a practitioner that maybe has a few more things in their toolbox to try because it is a lot of trial and error. Would you agree? And I would, I would, I'd even say within an individual patient, even though I feel like I have the skills, I think you still have to play a little bit. You have to get to know how this body responds to certain things. And so um, it isn't just about, again, we can't treat to a protocol. There is no protocol. Mm -hmm. And there is no set of goals that a person should have. They'll have the goals that they have. So what's important, I think, is bearing in mind that each clinician has a different set of skills and they're going to bring, like your journey may not stop at that one clinician. So, right. you know, try it, explore it. If, you, if you're measuring your progress, if you haven't made the progress you need, if you keep going back every single week for six months, they're probably not giving you... A long-term benefit you might need to try something else it, it isn't um uh, personal about the clinician it's just that right. you're, you're going to find certain skills and certain hands-on techniques are going to work for you but not for somebody else or for this even time in your life it may be that you have another injury it doesn't really work for you so um so, so bearing that in mind there is no one provider or one approach there's no one protocol that is the right way and it's possible that the person you saw did exactly the right thing for what you needed at that particular time and that, you know, you were maybe progressing through your symptoms. But I, I do just encourage people to continue to look for help. And um, it might mean that you go through a few vestibular therapists, you yep. know, until you find someone that you feel confident with. Um, it doesn't mean, like I said, that they're doing anything wrong. It just means that you've got to find the right person who has um, you know, can work with you to reach your goals and um, be patient with that. And I would even say I've seen some people sometimes who um, where I've said, I think you should stop and deal with something else. So someone might be going through a lot of emotional issues um, and, and stress and, and it can be very stressful and very, um, very, very draining. It takes a lot of energy when you don't know where you are in space and it can um, it can be quite draining in certain ways. So occasionally someone has need to take a pause from physiotherapy or physical therapy and actually, for example, you know, seek counseling for a little while to kind of settle their nervous system and kind of calm down and find, be in a better place, have some more tools to deal with the stress and anxiety. Because if I give someone a home exercise that makes someone feel a bit dizzy, that can be anxiety provoking for some people. So sometimes um, I also would suggest they need to take a pause from me for a little bit. I've also had another couple of examples where um the jaw, the TMJ, is uh, the, yes. the, the muscles are intimately connected with the upper part of the neck. And um, I have a certain set of skills for dealing with the jaw and I'm comfortable with what I know, but I also know I have my limits. So I've had a few people over the years who had significant TMJ jaw issues that really needed someone more specialized for a period of time. And, you know, they're ringing in their ears and some of their symptoms will really calm down. Then they'll come back to me for doing the vestibular rehab piece. And wow, I have half the work to do. So I think that, you know, even I, I don't pretend to know it all. And I don't pretend to work alone. It's um, I know it's hard because you're, if you're seeking private practitioners, you don't have a sense of community necessarily around you. You have to make your own healthcare team. It's not like in the public service where you might have a healthcare team that's quite easily defined. Um, and then also, um, you know, some people need almost like an occupational therapist to help with case managing certain situations like the return to work piece or like the um, the taking on certain activities or return to driving or certain things. So, you know, sometimes you do need to make a little bit of a team around you, even if it's a, a virtual team and not one that exists per se. <laughs> well, you have provided some amazing information to us. Is there anything that you can think about that you wanted to make sure we knew that you haven't been able to tell us as we kind of wrap up. Um, well, I would say for the caregivers out there, I would yeah. even say that it's a, it is difficult to appreciate what's going on. These people, uh, people who are experiencing neck-related dizziness could be experiencing he headaches and pain or maybe even um, ringing in the ears. They've got a lot of symptoms that are quite hidden. They're a bit like the walking wounded. So, you know, keeping lines of communication open, um, trying to find ways that you can maybe um, rejuggle the workload in the house. Um, it can be challenging to navigate the medical system, maybe asking, you know, do you want me to come to your appointment with you to take notes or because sometimes when you're the person going through things, you don't take it all in. You've, 
you know, you've, you, you, all you want to hear is an answer or something like that, and you might stop listening at a certain point. So, you know, maybe thinking about um, how those around you can support you in your recovery and how you can maybe find ways to communicate with them and let them know what you're experiencing, because they don't know that you've woken up on a particular day with a bit of a weird wry neck because of a pillow change or something, and then you're even more dizzy than usual, because you look pretty good. So um, I would say that that would be something I would also keep in mind and knowing that there's not one journey. There's not um, there's no one way that this is dealt with. And it's sometimes for people, it's a long journey. So, you know, that would be something I'd keep in mind. I think it's so important validating the symptoms and the experiences of all of those watching and all of those who come with neck pain and dizziness and vertigo related neck pain. Just I know Nicole and I are validating the fact that you have a real issue and that it interferes with your life and that can be challenging. And um, maybe you have someone around you who is encouraging you to give up or quit looking. But um, those of you who are here on the talk, we're glad that you're here watching because we want you to find the right care that you need. And we're grateful that the Vestibular Disorders Association would have this talk and have us uh, be able to talk about neck related dizziness and um, use the links, use the website to find a practitioner that will help you. And if you like what you see, um, I'm gonna end the broadcast today with just a little video commercial that will um, you know, support the sponsorship of this talk by the Vestibular Disorders Association. Nicole, I really, really appreciate you being here with us. It was delightful to talk to you. The time went really fast because this is a huge topic. I thank you for the chat um, and the comments in the, in the comment section. We'll continue to manage that. And, um, you know, if people want to reach out to Nicole, she'll check in and see the comments as well, or we can forward messages to her. Um, Absolutely. But but I appreciate you being here today and I look forward to having another chat with you about your vestibular practice and your experience with patients. So say mm -hmm. bye-bye and we'll tune off with this little video. I can find it. One second. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Everyone's smiling. Look, okay, where is it? It's so good. I have to, here it is.